Good afternoon. As we wait for people to connect today, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. I'm Rachel Rosen, the Communications Director for Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our staff, our president, Mark Melman, our board and our board co-chairs, Todd Richmond and Ann Lewis, welcome. We hope you and your loved ones are well and are having a good summer. In just a minute, I'll turn it over to DMFI President Mark Melman to introduce our distinguished guest. But first, I wanted to go over a couple of items. If you like what you're hearing today, I encourage you to please check us out on social media and follow us. We're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. You can also sign up for our news and updates on our website at dmfi.org. And if you want to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature on your Zoom interface. And if you're on Facebook, you can just type it right into the comment section. With that, I'm going to turn it over to DMFI President Mark Melman to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you all for being with us. Uh, we are appreciated. We are delighted and proud to be celebrating Pride Month uh, with you. Uh, let me just note, before I introduce our distinguished uh, guest, uh, that uh, Israel uh, is this country that uh, is very much in the forefront of the struggle for gay rights. Uh, Idan will talk about that in, in more detail, uh, as well as the challenges that remain. But just to bring you a little bit of perspective, uh, the new Knesset uh, in Israel, 5% uh, of the members are openly gay, uh, the fourth highest in the world uh, after the uh, Britain, Liechtenstein, and the Scottish Parliament. Uh, so uh, Israel ranks right after those in terms of the number of openly gay, uh, <coughs> excuse me, members of its uh, Knesset. Uh, well above the United States, we have uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, 12 uh, openly gay members of the House and the Senate, uh, which is wonderful, but that's only about 2.2% per, uh, of, uh, of the 535 members in the U.S. Congress. Um, one of those uh, openly gay members of the Knesset uh, is our guest, uh, who is also the Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel, Idan Roll. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting the Deputy Foreign Minister a couple of weeks ago in Israel, and he is a superstar, uh, as you will see. Uh, all of us will be hearing about him for a long time to come. Uh, he is a member of the Yesh Atid Party. Uh, he's the founder of a Proud Front, uh, a movement dedicated towards increasing the LGBTQ representation uh, in Israel's political arena. Uh, in the Knesset, he was a champion of LGBTQ rights and progressive legislation. He's a lawyer. Uh, who worked in law firms on high tech. Uh, before that, he served in the IDF uh, in, in a tech and intelligence unit. Um, and he is uh, married to a uh, famous Israeli singer. His husband's a famous singer uh, in Israel. And they are expecting their second child in a few weeks. Uh, so mazal tov uh, for that. But it is my great honor, my great pleasure to introduce the Deputy Foreign Minister uh, of Israel, newly installed Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel, Idan Roll, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure, and thank you for this kind introduction. Um, uh, from time to time, you might see me uh, looking sideways because I have my baby monitor on the side, and my son is a bit sick, so I'm, I'm monitoring that he's falling asleep and fine. So, if don't get distracted by it. And now that I said it, you will probably just get more distracted. So, yeah. Um, so hello everyone, it's, it's, an, it's evening now in Israel, it's the end of the week, but for you guys it's, uh, it's noon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to tell you a bit about myself and why I'm so happy that we're all uh, having this meeting together, this uh, opportunity to talk and to chat. Um, well, like Mark said, I actually were, I wasn't aware that we're fourth in the world, that's very exciting. And even uh, we have a few ministers the Minister of Health, and uh, I'm a Deputy Minister. We even had the last administration at even three, I think, and that is great. And, you know, Israel is not a perfect country, but we're doing uh, such ama amazing strides forward. And one of the arenas where we are doing very well is, the, is our journey towards equality for the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, I'm 37 years old. And when I was much younger, let's say when I was a teenager, and let's say 20 years ago, um, there was no one to look up to. We, there were no role models out in the open, no, almost none, almost no one. No one on the media, no entertainers, no singers, no 
um, judges, no reporters, no nothing, almost nothing. And nowadays, when I look, uh, you know, and when you open the TV and when you look in the Knesset, when you look in the government, and we you look at such prominent figures and individuals all over Israel uh, uh, that are out and proud and doing so great in their professional uh, expertise and also representing the community, uh, it makes me feel uh, safer for the younger, you know, for the younger generation. Even ten years ago, um, you know, you get that when you go when you uh, get older and you get. Uh, more experienced in your in your field of expertise. In this case, the LGBTQ community, you allow yourself to be a bit of a historian. So, um, in a way, uh, things have shifted and changed so rapidly in the past ten years that even ten years ago, you can you you can get overwhelmed just by reviewing what we what we had back then. So nowadays, you have a lot of different role models, and you also have so many different cities around Israel that celebrate pride. And I take that as, as you know, as, in, as a signal, as a symbol of our success in uh, reaching um, uh, and being um, accepted all over Israel. You know, a few years back, when someone uh, uh, went out of the closet, it was obvious that he or she would move to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is the liberal city, the liberal capital of Israel. It's one of the most, uh, liberal uh, cities uh, all over the world. Um, and what I've noticed in the past, I guess, five years that our community is growing uh, and it's maturing and it's getting more uh, diversified. I don't know if, it's a, if that's a word. Uh, you can see the community is more, is more diverse and you can see that uh, we've matured a lot. And, uh, you know, every year approaching uh, Pride Month, which in Israel is more like Pride Quarter because it, it, it expands to approxim approximately three months because we have so many different events. We are like one of the largest, uh, we have one of the largest numbers of Pride events per capita in the world. Um, and it's interesting because it's all rather new. So people come up to me as a representative and they ask me that all the time, every year, it's like, so uh, why do you feel the need in you is like the community? Why do you feel the need to throw so many different private events? Why do you need to, to go all to all these different cities and towns? And, and wh why, why do you do that? And every time I smile and I explain that there's no like higher committee that, you know, sets the standards or, or the strategy for this upcoming year, pride-wise, no, and there's no a pre, there's no president for the gay community in Israel. What happens is that, and it's a wonderful thing, uh, life is stronger than politics, and you know people uh, go, get out, uh, come out of the closet, and they meet someone, and they fall in love, and they move in together, and maybe they form a family, and then they uh, move back to live close to their you know, to their parents. In Israel, we all live very close. I mean, it's, you know, it's like an hour drive is, is far away and you want your parents' help and you want to feel, and then you have, let's say you, you lived all your twenties in Tel Aviv and then you move to Natanya, which is a more conservative place and a more diverse place. And then you, uh, you want to feel included and you want to feel accepted and safe and you go to the teacher in, in your kindergarten and you talk to her and say, okay, let's talk about a new family and let's, and let's discuss this and that with the kids so my son can feel accepted and feel like it's all natural and, and, and you know, feel equal. And then you start a Facebook page and you, for, and you initiate uh, an LGBTQ family picnic in Yavne. And then in Batyam, someone comes up and says, okay, uh, let's uh, fundraise some money and throw the first gay parade in, uh, in Bet Shemesh. And the first year it goes mm -mm, somewhat like that. And, you know, you have some struggles because it's the first time. And then the second year, it's tradition. So every time people come up to me and ask like, okay, we want to, we want, we want to start something. Right now, there's someone in, in Kfar Vradim. That's the first time they've had it ever. So it's happening next week. 
And they come to me usually and ask, okay, so what should we do? And I always tell them, just, just start, just hit the ground running, just start a Facebook group, find some people, they will come. Just let the, you know, let the message be heard and they will come. And if you don't get the money, just do something modest and just do it. And the second time it will be a bit less harder, but still you will have struggles and you'll do it. And the third time it will be tradition. And the fourth time, the the local um you know the, the mayor will take charge of it and will fund it and then there, there you go it happens so um so this is how it happens and this is how you have families all over israel and you have couples and you have people feeling feeling um so free and great and you know what i have two stories about that uh and then i'll try and wrap it up because i'm a politician and i can go on on and on forever um the first one is that I'm amazed each time that each gay event in, different, in each different city is completely different. So everyone is aware of Tel Aviv being like, you know, 250,000 people from all over the world being a huge party. And then you have Jerusalem Gay Pride Parade, which is, it's, it's so different. You have to have this sense of holiness and it's completely different. And then you have Yavne, which is more from family oriented and Haifa, which is like, it's, it's Haifa. And then you have Be'er Sheva, which is lots of students. And then you have um, Bet Shemesh, which is a Haredic town. And two years ago was the first time and people were re really worried about it. And it went well, just great. And, you know, just yesterday, we we're like, uh, we've been having like a four day and fortnight marathon in legislation because we have a new administration. Um, so we've been basically sleeping in our parliament, in our, in our chambers all the, for, for a few days now. And, and then a group of, of uh, this youth group from Yerucham came and they asked to meet with me. Now, Yerucham is a small traditional town, town in the southern part of Israel. That is somewhere that no one 10 years ago would ever come out of the closet there and stay there. And there they were. And they came up to me and a few of them were, you know, openly gay. And uh, they are like prominent uh, teenagers in their, in their schools and in their city. And they were out and proud and safe. And it was incredible. And I sat there with the former uh, mayor of Yerucham and he told me, you know, I'm so happy to see that this is happening in my, in my town. Who, have, who would have thought 10 years ago that kids would come out of the closet and just form youth movements in Yerucham for, for gay kids. So amazing things ha are happening uh, due to many forces. Change is, is made because of many, many, many people, you know, going out there and, and, and doing something small. Uh, it happens due to legislators and diplomats and uh, civil organizations, but it also happens due to one person uh, working in tech coming up to his uh, or hers HR person and saying, I want to do something to, to, you know, in honor of gay pride month, let's have someone over for a lecture. And this is how change happens. And it's happening all over Israel. Uh, it's not perfect yet. We have a lot of legislation left to do, but we're making big improvements. And I think that this new administration uh, uh, have lots of opportunities in store for my community. And um, I'm excited to see what we're gonna do. Uh, so with that, um, that's that's like an intro. And I would love to get your questions and uh, hear what you have to say, and and hopefully provide new information about our life here in Israel and our connection between you guys and us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Roll. I really appreciate it. I've learned so much already uh, from your opening remarks. I wanted to uh, remind our audience to please submit a question. If you're on Facebook, you can put it into the comment section. If you're on Zoom, just uh, type it into the Q&A section. I'll try to get to as many as we can. But I wanted to kick off uh, the Q&A with a comment uh, from Facebook from Jeremy. Jeremy says, Mazel Tov, Idan Roll, on your wedding and your appointment as Deputy Foreign Minister. I'm a longtime fan of your husband and have become a follower of your activities as well. Thank you for the leadership you provide to the Israeli LGBTQ community. That's very sweet, thank you. Yes. I'm also okay. a fan of my husband, he's very, very talented. 
<laughs> that's good. I, I also like my husband too very much. So that's very good. Okay, great. So I'm going to uh, get started uh, uh, with a question. Um, in the U.S., LGBTQ rights, has there's been a huge divide uh, between right and left. In Israel, at least among the secular parties on the right, this seems far less true. The first openly gay minister, for example, was from Netanyahu's Likud party. Have gay rights been less controversial on the secular right than in the U.S.? And if so, why do you think that might be? Oh, yes. Well, that's an excellent question, by the way. Uh, definitely so. It's completely different. I mean, I always offer people here uh, or when people are covering the Israeli politics, I'm, I always offer them a different narrative. I think that it's not a matter of right or left. It's a matter of liberal versus conservative. Um, and gay rights, uh, and you have massive uh, polls and, and um, studies that show that each time, time after time, it's not a big deal. Even like the more conser conservative crowds, the, you know, the religious, the orthodox, not the heretic, but the orthodox uh, are completely fine according to every survey with uh, gay marriage and with uh, surrogacy. And, and I think that what we are facing in Israel in a way is um, two things. I'm trying to simplify and not you know, make it too in length because it's, it's, a, big, it's a big question. First of all, um, I think that our politics haven't completely caught up with the people yet. I mean, people are far more liberal and acceptive of gay rights. And you can see that because we have like 70 different cities throwing gay pride events, okay? And it's all over the, all of, of, of Israel. Uh, but our politics are still, have, well, we still haven't caught up with that. Um, the second is that there is this, you know, political bond uh, partnership between Netanyahu and the Haredic um, uh, parties. But given that was not the case, like in the past, that wasn't the case, uh, Likud has no problem with uh, gay rights. So it also given the situation, you know, because if, if the allies were different, in, in you know, politics and you know, allies tend to shift and change over time. So uh, this could be per perceived completely different and new opportunities will come up for sure. Minister, could you tell us about the, the proud front movement that you started mm -hmm. in Israel? Yes, a politician would always love to talk about something they've done. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we tend to rumble on and on and on about ourselves. You know, that's like a given. Um, when actually I'm, I'm, I have to be honest and say that I was never, until a few years ago, I was never a big activist, like social activist or political activist. Activist. I was part of my community. I was well aware of my community and my rights, but I was never in the forefront of changing things. And in 2017, uh, our Supreme Court, demanded uh, the, the um, administration, the, the government to, to explain why it was denying um, gay couples to adopt legally in Israel. Uh, and what usually happens in situations like that is that you, the government forms a committee or find a way to buy time and you know, kind of make the thing go away or dissolve. And for some reason, they said the truth. Um, I don't know if it was on purpose or someone just, you know, made a mistake. And they said, we think that it will be a burden for a child to uh, be raised in a same sex, uh, by a same sex couple. It would be a burden and it, it, they're, not, um, they're not adequate to be parents. They're not, you get, you get the idea. And this started this whole huge protest, the biggest in the community's history. And, and it got me all righted up because we were already thinking about forming our family. We were like in the start of our process. And I thought, is this, is my beloved country saying I'm not, I'm not you know, suitable to be a parent? Is that possible? It was such a, you know, a blunt remark. So um, it got me thinking that we had 
so much influence in all walks of life, in, in media, in entertainment, in art, in so many different you know, arenas. And we were lacking um, political power. And so it hit me that two things were needed. First was that we shouldn't make um, LGBTQ people uh, choose a specific party just because they're part of our community. We should acknowledge the fact that there's also a rainbow of political ideas and, and you know, beliefs. And that if someone raised, was raised in a more conservative way, he can be conservative, but also you know, demand gay rights. So I wanted to provide a platform for every different individual to be heard. And the second one was that we needed to increase our political power. And it, was, it played a big and significant role in the big protest of 2018, where we had 100,000 people go out in the street. And one more thing, it wasn't 100,000 gay people necessarily. It wasn't. I, I think that what made us uh, take this next leap as a community was the fact that we managed to convey our narrative and our needs to the general public. It was the first time that you saw, you know, my parents came to this huge, huge protest and my, and my aunt and my brothers, and it wasn't about only gays for gays or like LGBTQ for ourselves, we managed to harness the, the families and the surrounding circles and it was amazing. And, we've, and we also managed to go on strike. The whole private sector went on strike for the LGBTQ community. And ever since uh, we've been doing uh, very well and there's still lots to do. That's great, I'm glad there's such a strong community there. I wanted to ask a question uh, that our, our board member, Todd Richmond, posed uh, about pinkwashing. He, uh, Todd says, great job and thank you for, for your leadership. What do you say and what do you think is the best way to fight against people that say, that hi, that say highlighting gay rights in Israel is pinkwashing? And can you also explain the, the concept of or the idea of pinkwashing for us? Yes, well, pinkwashing is basically trying to portray uh, a certain country as being very openly uh, open and, and accepting of gay rights without it being so. And I've heard that claim before. Uh, and I, I'm happy to address it because, you know, fighting pinkwashing is also something that is, is my job to do. Um, as I said in the beginning, Israel isn't perfect. Obviously, I'm still expecting my second child in, via surrogacy in Oklahoma a bit closer to where you guys are at right now than where to, to where I'm sitting right now. So it's not perfect. But I take into consideration two things. First of which is that we are a young community. And like I said, we've made massive strides forward in the last decade, okay? Um, so things take time. I mean, the USA is so much you know, more mature and experienced than us. And it, it even took you guys up to like 10, 10 years ago, nine years ago, when gay, when same-sex marriage were, became, you know, legal federally. So things take time. Uh, and I think that building the right political power from the ground up, you know, to make change takes time. And because I can see the progress, I'm feeling confident that we're not pinkwashing. Also, you know, we are a country in the Middle East with... Uh, you know, a, a very, we are a very traditional country and a very traditional society. So change sometimes take longer. You need to, to look at, at the starting point. I mean, the USA is first of and foremost, we are all Americans, right? But our identity is different. It's always tangled up with, with being Jewish and Jewish values. And, and it, there, it creates a conflict for many conservative people. So, um, so it might take a bit longer, but I'm, I can definitely say that saying that uh, living here is good for the uh, LGBTQ community is not being washing, you know, because you feel safer and, and all over Israel nowadays, 
and you have uh, a gay families, new families all over Israel, not just in Tel Aviv. And, and it's well accepted and you see it everywhere on TV. So yes, not everything is done correctly in the legislation part, but people are safe and prosperous here and accepted and out and proud. And I feel, I feel it's my job to say we've come a long way. We, we're not there yet completely, but we'll get there. And it's my job to get there. And Minister Roll, do you have a message that you'd like to share with others who may be afraid to speak up about their sexual orientation? Yes. Um, well, that's an interesting question because if you would have asked me that 10 years ago, um, I would probably answer differently also. Um, I now, from where I'm, from where I'm standing right now, from where I'm at in life right now, I understand the collective power of people coming out and speaking about our rights. Um, I used to think that, you know, it's someone's, it, it's everyone's prerogative to, you know, not have to talk about it. And it still is. But if you happen to do it, and if you agree to do it, there's a cumulative power to it and it's very very strong and you know what i see what my husband does and how much power he gives to everyone by being so uh, out and honest and you know what I, I even see it about our family because i'm a very private person and still i i need i know that and and i pay a certain price for mm, showing my family and our lifestyle and my and my son that's not something I would do by nature. This is something I do because I think that for many people, even if they don't object to our community, seeing how a new family, an LGBTQ family looks and acts and loves, it helps them understand. People uh, tend to accept and fear less of something they actually know what it's like. You know, with the uncertainty is, is the most terrifying thing. So when you say you have two guys um, living together and raising a son, if you've never seen it before, it might sound like a weird concept or intimidating for someone who's never been around people. So whenever someone tells a story, I always tell that to people, you know, the workplace is such an important arena. We work so many hours of the day. You guys, the same, we're practically the same almost in, uh, according to researches that I've read. And when you come out of the closet, when you put in your cubicle, a picture of you yourself and your partner, and sometimes someone asks about it, uh, you know, during lunch, you never know what you've done to the other person. Maybe that was the first time he met, you know, a lesbian couple, a gay couple, a trans person. So, so telling your story and, and sometimes it's hard, but it, it has such a big benefit for all of us together. If it's okay, I may turn to uh, some questions about the new Israeli government now, but we may also uh, come back uh, to pride, to pride topics too, if folks have everything, questions. Everything is fine. Yeah. Thank you. And, and just a reminder to the audience, please uh, submit your questions in the Q&A section or type it into Facebook. Uh, we were, uh, DMFI's board was so happy uh, to host uh, Foreign Minister Lapid a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of his goals that he talked about specifically was strengthening support for Israel within the Democratic Party in the U.S. And I wanted to ask you how you will help go about doing that. Well, I just met a uh, few a few days ago in the Knesset, I, uh, I had the pleasure to meet uh, a delegation from, of, of, from the Jewish community in New Jersey, northern part of New Jersey. And we had a really great open conversation about how all of us view this partnership. And I, I use the term partnership because I feel that it's our goal and our responsibility to invite Jewish communities from all over the world, to invite them in to the conversation early on. I mean, I don't wanna be there just to ask for help or just to 
inform you guys of what we're all about and what we need you guys to do. I feel like we're all one big family and this is how we should act. And, and it actually has like specific things that, you know, uh, that it entails. For example, we're now, um, um, we're now figuring out what the Israeli story is all about. And I feel like when you think about the Israeli story, you need to ask also our brothers and sisters, you know, from abroad, how you perceive Israel and how you wish for this connection to be. And, you know, at times people used to say, some politicians, you know, if you support Israel, you should do Aliyah. I don't feel that's the case in any way. I feel like finding the way to, to strengthen the ties and to, and to um, respect our, you know, brother communities abroad and ask for your opinion. I feel like just because you guys don't live in Israel doesn't mean that you don't have a valid and important voice to be heard uh, about Israel. So what I'm hoping to do is, and I'm already doing it in all sorts of roundtables and, and forums that I'm, I'm forming, I'm trying to um, collect information and opinions from Jewish communities all over uh, uh, North America and hear what you think about Israel openly. It's okay, what do you think about what we have been going so far in the last few years? What are your hopes and dreams? You know, we can sit here and complain in Israel about uh, the Jewish diaspora don't care that much about coming to Israel or visiting Israel as it used to be. And from my perspective, when if that's, that's the case, we should be sitting and asking, okay, what can we do? What have we done that may have, may have affected that? And how can we do things differently now in order to re, um, um, how do you say that? To reintroduce uh, Jewish communities to Israel. You know, we have a lot of younger uh, uh, Jewish people that are not feeling that strike uh, a strong connection to Israel. And I don't want to accept it as, you know, as a given, but I also don't want to uh, finger point and say someone's to blame. I feel like it's our responsibility as the Jewish state to accommodate your needs and to help you and see what you need from us and what can we do to make you guys feel more welcome here and, and safe where you're at and safe to be pro-Israel because being pro-Israel is not always so easy. And I know what's going on in some of the campuses all over the all over uh, the states is is you know it's a struggle. I've heard from many people saying our kids are not comfortable being a pro-Israel online in social media, social media, and on campus. And I think it's, it's our responsibility to change that together with you guys. Does that make sense? Absolutely, definitely. I, if I could just um, follow up on what you've said about social media, I'm, I'm interested. It certainly, uh, DMFI spends a lot of time online um, uh, promoting the U.S.-Israel relationship and occasionally sort of waging battles uh, when, when they need to, need to be sort of waged. But what, what do you see your role as doing on social media? Do you think there is an absence of pro-Israel voices among Israelis on social media? And should there be something done about that? Well, I think there's so much to do about it. First of all, um, we, are we are outnumbered. I mean, we need to convince the world and introduce Israel to the world and say, these are our values. And, you know, we, uh, I mean, Israel, have so, Israel has so many shared values with the United States and obviously with the Democratic Party, but not everyone views that as such. So we need to introduce uh, uh, different narratives of Israel. You know, why do people always feel like that Israel is about the conflict? Why do people not, are not aware that our, for example, that this new administration has a record number of female ministers? that we have an Arab minister, that we have an, a, a disabled minister, that we have a, a, a two openly gay ministers. I mean, we, we, I feel like Israel has been going through a rough year and COVID was rough on us, as obviously, as well. And we came out of that with new hope. 
and I'm I, I'm hoping to introduce a vision of hope from Israel because I feel uh, like in Israel many societies struggle right now with a polarized society and this new administration that we're doing is anything but obvious anything but you know a given and I feel like it presents a new concept that even in a very polarized society you can find a way to mend the internal rifts and form this very diverse coalition that can work together and I feel that many societies around the world need that right now. I mean, Israel is no different. Um, we have been going as, as you know, the, the entire globe has been going through, uh, a, um, how would you say, a process of getting more, you know, getting more internalized and shutting down to foreign, uh, you know, ties and getting even more polarized on the inside. And we're trying to fix that in a way. And this is our answer to our situation. And hopefully, hopefully we can show the world that and maybe uh, find some new common ground. Mr. Rowe, could you talk to us about some of the other top priorities for the new Israeli government? I know we, we just talked at, at length about strengthening the US-Israel relationship, particularly among Democrats. What else is on the agenda? Well, we have, like I said, I mean, this government emerged from an ongoing crisis. We had uh, uh, Shomel Chomot, the guardian of the world, but, we, you know, and uh, the same time as we had guardian of the world, we also had some very uh, complicated time internally. Uh, and I feel that uh, COVID had a very massive impact on our society. Uh, we 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 used to be one society. Okay, I've served in few wards, and and what always um, symbolized our society, in my opinion, was that when the times get tough, we we get closer. We 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 come together, and COVID for me um, was the first time in our history, at least the one that you know, in the years that I've been around. Uh, it was the first time that things went tough and we all went our separate ways. And we're still uh, dealing with the repercussions of that and the re huge repercussions. And the Haredic sector was feeling that they were held accountable and the Arabs felt that they were not getting enough resources to deal with uh, COVID and the general public felt that they were um, getting too many restrictions, but they were upholding the rules better. So it wasn't fair. And you know what, how you can see that it still exists. Uh, yesterday in the Knesset, I answered the question from a, from a Knesset member. It's part of my job. And he asked about anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, anti and I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. And Anti-Semitism, yeah. Anti-Semitism, sorry. You. I've been awake for approximately 50 hours. So some of my English slips away. Um, so, um, so I talked about how I view things and what we're doing in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in favor of all Jewish communities abroad. And one of the Haredic um, um, members of Knesset told me, are you also uh, talking to, are you also like talking to um, Orthodox communities? like in, in a very sarcastic way. And I was appalled and I was like, yes, but what would ever make you think that we weren't? I mean, how did this also become, how did anti-Semitism also become now a thing that like is affected by our internal rift uh, between Haredic and, and secular? Like if just because I'm a circular person, I'm a circular Jew doesn't mean that I don't care or talk to you know orthodox leaders around the world and this is just a symbol of the problem so fixing that is a huge issue also the economy we've had a rough time with covid and we need to fix that and also we need to address some major issues um our transportation issue and and infrastructure both digital and 
physical infrastructure in Israel needs a big upgrade. In, in order for us to stop wasting so many hours of the day sitting on the road, we need to, we need to accommodate working remotely and many things that worked for us during COVID and also climate. I mean, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that I wasn't informed enough on this topic until the kids of the world woke me up and said, you know what, you guys need to, you, to get it together. And now it's a top priority for Yashatid and for this administration. And hopefully we'll do great things in that aspect also. And also gender equality, which has been, a, we've had a rough few years in that aspect and hoping that having a record number of female ministers will give that a push also. That's all great. I wanted to pick up on uh, what you said about COVID-19. And of course, I think I speak for the folks on the call. We've, we've followed uh, how Israel has uh, handled uh, the COVID-19 response, certainly leading, leading globally uh, with its vaccination rate. You're now dealing, as, as, as certain states in America are too, with the Delta variant. Can you fill us in where Israel is and what Israel, the Israeli government's thinking about, about this, this uh, next part? of a COVID response. Okay, yes, yeah, so uh, we are definitely, uh, you know, keeping a close eye on the Delta variant and we're concerned, but like moderately concerned because as we get also information for colleagues all over the world, uh, the US is, is a big, you know, prominent uh, um, nation that we're looking at to see how it evolves also. Um, it seems that the vaccinations are effective in, in a way that people may uh, get COVID-19, may get in, um, infected, but they won't get sick or host hospitalized in a way. So we're trying to watch uh, if that is true. I mean, that's the presumption that we've seen so far that uh, the hospital, hospital that is, sorry about that, hospital, hospitalization rates are still low despite the variant uh, getting, uh, uh, spreading very wide. But with that said, uh, because the majority of Israelis uh, from the age of 16 and younger are not, are still haven't been vaccinated, so it poses a threat. So I think the upcoming two weeks will be crucial to deciding what to, what to do. The main thing that we try to do different than the last administration is to be very transparent with the Israeli public and to uh, explain our thought process and our, our criteria in order to uh, decide what to do. And, and we're trying to be, um, to work together and to uh, tell the Israeli public in advance what we think is happening. For example, just a few days ago, Ago, you could have seen the Prime Minister Bennett standing in the in our national airport with uh, the Minister of Transportation and the Minister of Health together, holding an, a press conference, each you know talking about their field and working together. And that is something that we're proud of. And it used to be more of a one-man show, and now we're trying to get everyone together in order to work fast. We have our work cut out for us because COVID, you know, every time you think like you, you're out of the woods, it might draw you back in for a while. So, yeah. Minister Roll, I have a, a question uh, from Lawrence, and he asks uh, you to discuss how the, the, new, the new Israeli government, the Knesset, will uh, work with or, or um, uh, confront or the uh, Palestinian Authority and how that might be different than previous governments? Well, we don't have all of our uh, foreign part. I'm sorry, I'm just, my son is just sitting in his bed for some reason after you already fell asleep. Sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm also keeping a close eye on, on him. Um, we don't have all of our foreign policy planned out just now because we've been, we're relatively new. We've been here for about two and a half weeks. But I can safely say that Israel has never um, missed out on an opportunity for peace. I mean, that is, you have an evidence for that in our peace agreements that are, you know, uh, 
have matured well, like with Jordan and with Egypt, but also with the with the Emirates and everything that has happened in the Abraham agreements last year. So we're always up for that, but um, but I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with the Palestinian people. I feel like um, we will do our best always to to um, find new opportunities in the Middle East. And we have some new uh, opportunities. I'm sorry, can I can I just stop for a second? Sorry. Of course. I just, sorry, just, in, just, uh, it's just calling my name. Sorry, just for a second. No, no problem. No problem. I think we're we're going to have a, another minute or so with Minister Roll, and it looks like uh, our board co-chair Ann Lewis has has stepped on uh, to to uh, join us and then to close us out of the event. So we'll we'll give Minister Roll another minute or so. In the meantime, I do want to encourage you, maybe we can put it in the chat. Uh, last week, uh, right around uh, Juneteenth, we had uh, House Majority Whip Clyburn on for an event uh, celebrating the holiday. He talked about his, his advocacy work uh, to make Juneteenth a, a federal holiday too. So I would encourage folks to, to try and check that one out. And we can put that into the chat. We've done a lot of events over the past year, virtual events over the past year that are all available on our website. And we think that you'll enjoy uh, Minister Roll, if you're back and, and available, you're still uh, muted. You might you might need another minute or so. Okay, I think I think Minister Roll still still working. So I think uh, we are nearing the top of the hour. I'm going to hand it over. Uh, oh no no sorry I was muted. Sorry I'm I'm okay. back. Sure. Sorry okay. about that. He's just feeling ill and has a fever. So sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. We, we hope he gets well soon. And I, I know that's Thank a you. Thank you. <laughs> thick little ones. But so I'll give you a couple of minutes if you'd like to, to wrap up and then I'm going to hand it over uh, to our board co-chair and Lewis. Okay, so I'll do my best to wrap up quickly so I don't take more of your time and of the chairman's time. Um, I personally, and it's always, it's also, you know, the, our ministers, uh, you know, uh, set of beliefs. We uh, feel that our new administration um, poses lots of new opportunities for our connection with the Democratic Party. And we feel that despite this being a very diverse coalition, and I know that you don't, you can't, I mean, no one can see right from the get-go everything, how, how everything is going to pan out. But we do have something very special that makes me very optimistic and confident about what's about to happen we have mutual trust. Uh, forming this government took a while and some of the people have never spoken to each other in the past. But when you get so many people sitting in a room for a few weeks, you form ties. And now we have all kinds of you know, topics that we don't necessarily agree on, but we wanna agree on and find a solution and we just sit and pen them out. And it's a strong thing. And we having um, respect and people are saying good things about each other and working together. You know, you, you could have seen just last week, uh, the ministry, she's, uh, the fe she's female, the female minister of transportation sat down with the minister, also female minister of, uh, of how do you say it? Um, so, so it, it, we're, sorry, I forgot how to say it. Aganata um, Sviva of protecting the environment and also the female minister in charge of, of gas. And they sat together and said, okay, we need to do something big in order to help climate. And that's like not something that you would necessarily see because the, the minister in charge of, of our gas resources doesn't necessarily see eye to eye with the minister in charge of protecting the environment. And so very interesting things are happening and very interesting new allies are happening. And we want to be champions of LGBTQ rights and, and, um, and women's rights. And we have so much to offer. And we mainly want to get back to the place where Israel has always been up to recently, which is having a great connection and the deepest, most valuable connection with 
America as a general, you know, in general of all parties in America. And we want to make uh, everything we can in order to strengthen this tie because we feel and I feel that this connection between the US and Israel is more than you know a strong connection. It's a connection based on shared values. And we want to emphasize these values. And I think this creates a platform for a very special and very um, uh, optimistic era that I see ahead for, you know, for us both. And hopefully this will turn out to be exactly like that. Thank you so much, Minister Roll. Before I hand it over to Anne, I wanted to read one comment that came in that I think you might enjoy. It's from Gabriel Quinto and, and uh, Gabe is the uh, mayor pro tem of El Cerrito. And Gabriel says, Deputy Minister Roll, we met back in 2019 when a wider bridge flew out to Israel during LGBTQ pride. Congratulations right. on your appointment and look forward to your success in getting more LGBTQ uh, members uh, running for office. So thank you again, Minister Roll. It's really a pleasure thank to you. have you. I know there's many, many demands on your time and I'm gonna hand it over to Ann Lewis, our board co-chair. Yeah. Thank you so much, Minister Roll, for speaking with us today, for sharing your story. And I must say for giving the best definition of tradition I've ever heard, and I intend to use it again. We know your agenda is full with the ministry, with the new government, and now we know with a little boy who's not feeling so well. So that makes it even more meaningful, and we really appreciate your taking time to speak with us. Uh, to those of you I can't see, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your support of DMFI. A gentle reminder, while you're still in a screen, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also go to dmfi.org, that's dmfi.org, and go to our Action Center to make your voice heard. We look forward to seeing you and hosting you again soon. Thank you. Thank you for all the valuable and, and uh, all the valuable work you're doing. And thank you for your support. And thank you for having me, everyone. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Idan. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. See you soon.